Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'll be talking about common abnormalities in the abdomen. And uh, there is considerable more detail in your syllabus, so today we'll be focusing on the images predominantly. And before I get started, I wanted to thank Dr. Wee Chong for his support. So abdominal ultrasound is basically the modality of choice. When, it, when we're evaluating right upper quadrant pain, gallstones, patient with jaundice and elevated um, liver enzymes, and patients with elevated creatinine. And it's useful in the multimodality evaluation of many different disease processes, including a surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with hepatitis and cirrhosis, cholangio-CA, and renal disease. Now, there are different components of the abdominal ultrasound, which have corresponding different CPT codes. Um, the complete abdomen um, includes um, the spleen and the, you know, both kidneys and the um, aorta IVC and portal vein. The right upper quadrant does not include um, the spleen or the left kidney. And uh, the renal exam includes the kidneys, the bladder, sometimes we see the prostate. And the aorta, there's a different CPT code for screen versus follow-up. Now I'm showing you this liver cine image of this liver uh, cine images because I think it's very important to incorporate cine images into all of your ultrasound protocols. Um, many times we see findings on the cine clips that the technologist or ourselves may not have picked up on the static images. So discussing, uh, first of all, parenchymal liver diseases, um, starting with fatty liver, the most common causes of fatty liver are obesity and drinking too much. And we, we usually see um, diffusely increased echogenicity of the liver plus or minus areas of sparing. And in severe cases, we'll see sound beam attenuation and decreased visualization of the vessels in the diaphragm more posteriorly. So here's a case of severe fatty liver where we have an echogenic liver, but as we progress more posteriorly, we, we, lose, um, we, we lose the sound beam. We, it, it basically attenuates. We lose any vascular definition we may have had more proximally. And we really don't see the diaphragm very well. I don't know if the diaphragm is this down here or, or this up, up, up here. Now fatty sparing and focal fat may mimic liver lesions, and we typically see these um, around the periportal regions of the left lobe of the liver, the gallbladder fossa, falciform ligament, porta hepatis, and the liver margins. And um, fatty sparing and focal fat can be, are usually geometric, they're usually not spherical, and if you put your transducer in the opposite plane, it should elongate, so this should help differentiate um, these entities from a, from a liver mass. One of the other hallmarks is that the hepatic vessels are not displaced. But if you're not confident if what you're seeing is either fatty sparing or focal fat, definitely you can do MRI in these patients. So here's a nice example. This is a sagittal image of the gallbladder with the adjacent liver. We see a triangular hypoechoic focus. And um, you can confidently call this fatty sparing. It's very angular, very geometric. Here's another case, another sagittal image, where we see sort of these elongated foci, hypoechoic foci along the gallbladder fossa. Again, you can confidently call these fatty sparing. Here's another transverse image of the gallbladder, where the, we see sort of a crescentic focus of, um, a crescentic hypoechoic focus. It doesn't, it's not a round mass, it's just kind of following the contour of the gallbladder fossa. Again, fatty sparing. Here's a nice example of fo focal fat where we see an echogenic focus draping around the vasculature of the liver. It's not displacing the vessels. Hepatitis. Um, hepatitis without cirrhosis is usually unremarkable by ultrasound. In our literature, traditionally, there's the description of the echogenic portal triads. But because our machines are so good now, this really doesn't hold true anymore because we see the echogenicity of the portal triads uh, normally. Um, but you may see hepatomegaly, heterogeneous uh, liver parenchyma, gallbladder wall thickening, or contraction, and periportal adenopathy. Now cirrhosis is fibrosis and regeneration of the liver, and the most common causes include alcohol and viral hepatitis. And basically we typically see in more advanced cases heterogeneous liver parenchyma, nodular contour, and ascites. And, um, and over time we'll see increased size of the cauda in the left lobes, followed by an overall decrease of the liver size um, more remotely. So here's a nice case of advanced cirrhosis in a patient with ascites, where we have a nodular contour of the liver, the liver's overall shrunken. We also can see vascular complications of cirrhosis. Um, here, for example, this is a sagittal image of the right lobe of the liver in a patient uh, with ascites, and we see um, a, a large varix. We can also see recanalized paraumbilical veins. <laughs> 
In this patient, the blue actually represents fugal flow within the portal vein, and the red actually represents a dilated hepatic artery. So we have reverse flow in the, in the portal vein from portal hypertension. We have many focal liver lesions we can review. We're going to review the most common. Cysts um, typically have an anechoic lumen, increased food transmission, echogenic back wall, simple cysts. We frequently see septations. Small cysts can be more difficult to discern, so Doppler sometimes can help us if we're trying to decide if this is a small cyst versus a vascular lesion. And the differential for complex cystic lesions includes hematoma, abscess, um, metastases, and biliary cystadenoma and cystadenocea. So here's a nice example of a large cyst within the right lobe of the liver. It's uh, almost eight centimeters long. We have the well-defined back wall. We have increased sued transmission, anechoic lumen, and a little bit of a septation there. Here's a patient with polycystic kidney disease that, who has multiple cysts within the liver, so also has polycystic liver. Notice that some of the walls of the cysts are a little bit irregular, and that's okay. And here's a cine, Im cine image of the same patient. Um, again, just, you know, anechoic lumens, very, very simple. Easy to call those cysts. Hemangiomas we see commonly, uh, especially in young patients. And the hallmark of hemangiomas is that they're homogeneous, they're hyperechoic, and they have increased food transmission. They're usually less than three centimeters and are not associated with increased blood flow. If you see blood flow in a lesion with, this, with the, these characteristics, you may also want to consider metastasis and hepatocellular carcinoma in your differential, especially given the patient's history. And in patients with hepatitis or cirrhosis or other types of liver disease, you may need MRI to, um, for further evaluation and characterization. So here's an example of basically a uniformly echogenic lesion. And you may argue there may or may not be some increased food transmission. But in a young patient with no risk factors for liver disease, I'm going to call this hemangioma and move on. I'm not going to follow this patient up. If this patient, however, has HCC or hemochromatosis or some other liver disease, then I'm going to get an MRI for confirmation that this is a hemangioma. Here's another example of a well-defined echogenic lesion within the liver, homogeneous, and no increased blood flow. We call this hemangioma and moved on to the next case. Now this is a bit of a busy slide, but this is to illustrate the importance of recognizing potential foci of hepatocellular carcinoma. The biggest risk factors are hepatitis and cirrhosis. Now the HCC can be very variable in its appearance on ultrasound and, and MR. It can be solitary, it can be multifocal, or it can be infiltrating. And these infiltrating types are very often difficult to see um, by ultrasound or MRI. It can have variable echogenicity. and um, and it also can be uniformly hypoechoic, like I said, like hemangiomas. They also can contain focal fat. Now, HCC, if there's vascular involvement, actually tends to invade the portal vein versus cholangiocarcinoma, which tends to compress the portal vein. And if you see portal vein involvement, then make sure to apply your Doppler to look for neovascularity um, that would occur in tumor thrombus. But you must do an MRI if you detect a lesion in a hepatitis or cirrhosis patient. These lesions are malignant until otherwise proven. So here's a nice example of a hypoechoic um, lesion within the right lobe of the liver. Patient with ascites, this patient had hepatitis. Um, we have increased blood flow associated with this lesion. So this to me is HCC until otherwise proven and I would get MRI for confirmation. Now here's a nice example of a patient we did experimentally with some ultrasound contrast. In the early phase there was hyper enhancement like there is on MRI. In the more delayed phase it washed out with a little bit of residual enhancement of the capsule, another HCC in this patient. Um, here's HCC with MRI correlation, hypoechoic lesion within the liver, no increased vascularity in this case. And the MR image of the inferior right lobe demonstrates some subtle hyper enhancement in the early phase and there's some washout in the delayed phase. So this was confirmed hepatocellular carcinoma. Now metastases are the most common solid liver lesion, usually from a GI primary, but lung and breast or other common uh, primaries we see METs within the liver. Um, METs are usually hypoechoic, but can have a highly variable appearance. And if we you know, want to look for METs in patients, we usually do CT. However, MRI and or biopsy may be helpful in patients who also have hepatitis or cirrhosis. So this is a patient with multiple metastases in the liver, and sort of the more you look, the more you see. And this lesion, for example, is pretty isoechoic to the liver with the hypoechoic rim. This lesion is heterogeneous. This lesion is diffusely hypoechoic. So as you can see, in the same patient uh, with uh, colon cancer, we can have considerable variability in the appearance of metastasis.
Now liver abscesses we don't see very often, but we may be the first individuals to see this because these patients may present with jaundice. So ultrasound may be the first modality to detect a liver abscess. And ultrasound can be used for aspiration to diagnose um, the organism or, or drainage and for follow-up um, during and after treatment. And differentials include um, hemorrhagic cysts, hematomas, and necrotic and cystic neoplasms. So this is a patient, this is the right lobe of the liver, so this is a patient who has a large, complex hypoechoic lesion. Doppler did not really add anything to this, um, to this case. We have diffusely increased through transmission, so this is not a solid lesion. This was shown to be a liver abscess in a patient who also was very sick. Now, in this patient, in this right lobe of the liver, we see multiple um, echo, sort of echogenic foci with some ring down and some dirty shadowing. This is the hallmark of air. So air is, can be um, echogenic with uh, this dirty shadowing, not the clean shadowing we, we typically see with stones, and some ring down, sort of the white that sort of keeps going down. And when we had MR correlation of this, this is the T1 uh, post-contrast axial image. Uh, we see areas of signal void which correspond to the air, and we see sort of this um, hypo-intense focus which is consistent of debris and fluid. Confirmation of the abscess. This is just to illustrate the multimodality approach to abscesses. Uh, this patient was drained under CT, and here's a large abscess, um, hypodense collection, foci of air, enhancing capsule, and the coil drainage catheter. Um, just a cute little granuloma with some posterior shadowing in a patient with sarcoid. We frequently, gra frequently see granulomas, but when they're tiny, we will not usually see this little focus of shadowing. Moving on to the gallbladder. Uh, gallstones are probably the most common reason why we do write up a quadrant ultrasound. Gallstones are intraluminal, they move, they're echogenic, and they shadow. However, stones less than five millimeters may not shadow. The differential includes polyps, which do not move and intraluminal cholesterol crystals, which can mimic floating stones. So here's a patient, this is a sagittal image of the gallbladder, which shows a gallstone with dense posterior acoustic shadowing. And here's another image of the gallstone, which has migrated down towards the gallbladder neck, just like Dr. Vosi mentioned, it's very important to look at the gallbladder neck. Now here's a patient who has a stone-filled gallbladder. The, the west complex refers to the echogenic wall that we see of the gallbladder. Then we have the echogenic sort of top layer of the gallstones with the dense posterior acoustic shadowing. So this is the wall, echo, shadow, stone-filled gallbladder. Sometimes, however, the, um, the echogenic wall and the echogenicity of the stones may be combined. So you may have just a single echogenic line showing you the wall and the echo with just the shadow. Now, sludge can have variable echogenicity, and it usually layers dependently. Tumefactive sludge can mimic stones, but it still should move. So again, mobility will help distinguish this from polyps or tumors. So here's a sagittal image of the gallbladder in which we sort of see, you know, polypoid echogenicity. We don't know whether this is a lesion or whether this is sludge. So then we move the patient, and where did the sludge go? It's up here. We put the patient prone. And here you can see the morphology of the sludge changed a little bit. It did not stay constant. So we knew that this was sludge and not a lesion. Now, acute cholecystitis typically represents about 5% of ER visits, and it's obstruction of the cystic duct or the gallbladder neck by a stone. And the hallmark, gallstones, gallbladder wall thickening, pericholecystic fluid, and sonographic Murphy sign. However, in elderly patients and patients who've been on anal analgesics, the sonographic Murphy sign may be negative. 5% uh, of acute cholecystitis is actually a calculus, and complications include perforation and gangrenous and emphyseminous cholecystitis. So here's a sagittal image of the gallbladder. This shows a gallstone with some partial shadowing, and we have a thickened wall. This patient came in with a typical clinical history and a positive sonographic Murphy sign. This is acute cholecystitis. Here's another patient, a sagittal image of the gallbladder, thickened gallbladder wall. We have a little bit, a little bit of pericholecystic fluid here. Transversely, when we imaged the patient, we saw the stone. Again, we saw more pericholecystic fluid. Here's another patient, a sagittal image of the gallbladder with some pericholecystic fluid. And this can sometimes be hard, especially in patients with ascites. You don't know if this is maybe some loculated ascites, whether it's pericholecystic fluid. But remember that this can actually indicate gallbladder wall perforation. So it's important to correlate this with your clinical history and other findings in the ultrasound. Just another example. Um, this is an, another nice example of acute cholecystitis where we see multiple um, echogenic gallstones and some shadowing. We see some hyperemia of the gallbladder wall and some edema of the gallbladder wall. And we also have the cine images to show that. 
to show the mobility of the stones as well. Now, acalculus cholecystitis typically, typically occurs in a sick or post-op patients uh, due to trauma, sepsis, or ischemia. The secondary signs of cholecystitis can be helpful when um, trying to decide if you actually have acalculus cholecystitis, but they're not always specific. And HIDA scan can be helpful, however, it can also give you false positive results. So here is a patient who presented with signs and symptoms of acute cholecystitis. We saw a thickened gallbladder wall, maybe a little bit of pericholecystic fluid, but no stones. We still call this acute acalculus cholecystitis. Here's another sagittal image of the gallbladder, which shows marked uh, gallbladder wall edema. Again, typical clinical history. This was called acalculus cholecystitis. Now, gangrenous cholecystitis is a more rarely seen. It's, the, it's due to the sloughing of the membranes and blood in the gallbladder lumen from severe, prolonged, or infected acute cholecystitis. Sonographic Murphy sign is usually negative because of necrosis of the nerve supply, and it's important to look for wall perforation in these patients. So here's an image of the gallbladder in a patient with ascites, and all of this is just basically necrotic, sloughed off membranes and hemorrhage within the gallbladder lumen. Now, emphyseminous cholecystitis is a surgical emergency. It can be rapidly progressive and fatal. And it usually occurs in diabetics and may occur with acalculus cholecystitis. And we typically see gas within the wall, uh, plus minus the lumen. And CT can help you with a diagnosis if you're unsure. So here's a sagittal image of the gallbladder in which we see sort of echogenic foci all along the wall. There's a little bit of ring down. So you may not be sure, is this air or is this adenomyomatosis? Here we also see a gallstone. So we CT this patient, and this patient had um, air within the gallbladder wall and a lot of air within the lumen, actually, more than we would expect with typical biliary intervention. We also happen to have a plain film in this patient, supine plain film of the abdomen, again, illustrates the air within the wall. An upright plain film demonstrates the air fluid level. So in my opinion, this patient had the perfect three-part physical exam, the x-ray, the CT, and the ultrasound. No other clinical exam necessary. Other causes of gallbladder wall thickening include chronic cholecystitis, volume overload, inflammatory or infectious processes such as hepatitis, and adenomyomatosis, in which we would see comet tail artifact, usually along the near wall of the gallbladder, just like we just saw in the emphyseminous cholecystitis case. And that's due to the cholesterol crystals in the Rakatansi Ashoff sinuses, and that's basically invagination of the mucosal layer into the muscular layer of the gallbladder wall. And this can present as diffuse refocal wall thickening or a fundal mass. So here's a patient who has diffuse thickening of the gallbladder wall, and it looks like it's cloned itself right here. But this is actually edema within the, within the bowel, adjacent bowel wall, and this patient has a considerable ascites. Here's a sagittal image of the gallbladder in which we see several shadowing gallstones, but what is this focus up here? So we do another image of it, and we see that we see some shadowing, we may see some ring down, um, and we applied um, some color Doppler to it, and we see some twinkle artifact. Now, twinkle is color artifact that it's not, that's not arterial or venous. It's basically just an artifact that we get with color Doppler, and it can help us distinguish um, stones and adenomyomatosis from other etiologies. So the cine images depict the stones very nicely, in addition to sort of this echogenic focus within the fundus of the gallbladder that has some ring down and some shadowing. And again, um, we do the color imaging and we see twinkle artifact, which what by Doppler proves not to be arterial or venous. Here's another case of basically gallbladder filled with adenomyomatosis. Here's the gallbladder. It's just filled with multiple echogenic foci, lots of ring down artifacts, adenomyomatosis filling the gallbladder. Now polyps, gallbladder polyps, cholesterol polyps are the most common type. They do not shadow and they are not mobile. And the management, um, basically nobody really cares about polyps less than five millimeters. We don't follow these patients up. Polyps 5 to 10 millimeters, it's variable. Some radiologists don't follow these patients up. A lot of us will follow the patient up once, maybe in like six months, to make sure that the polyp is stable. However, if you see a polyp that's greater than a centimeter, you should send the patient for surgical consultation because they, they may opt to operate or have a more stringent follow-up regimen. So here's a sagittal image of the gallbladder, which nicely shows um, a polypoid polyp, uh, adherent to the gallbladder lumen. This was over a centimeter, and this patient was sent for surgical evaluation. Here's another example where we see just, we barely even see the polyp, we see a little bit of ring down artifact. This is not a case that we would follow. 
And here's a tiny polyp adherent to the near wall of the gallbladder. Um, again, does not layer dependently, does not move, so we know that that's a polyp. Now, porcelain gallbladder is basically a calcified wall with dense posterior shadowing, and a stone-filled gallbladder can mimic the same appearance, um, as can um, emphysema and cholecystitis. And basically, um, CT is important in these patients to evaluate the extent of calcification and to look for possible masses, since there's an increased association with cancer. So here's an example of a patient where um, we, this is the top of the gallbladder. The wall is calcified. We see the echogenic wall with dense posterior acoustic shadowing. Patient happens to have ascites. And this is a patient with, this is the same patient we saw previously stone-filled gallbladder. It's really hard to differentiate the two. So we did a CT scan on this patient coming up. And this is just a cine image just showing, again, the dense shadowing. So our CT scan, the axial view, shows sort of irregular calcification along the gallbladder wall. Now a few images up, however, we see multiple stones within the gallbladder. So this patient had a porcelain gallbladder and a stone-filled gallbladder. And this is just to illustrate the, the, the point that our patients typically don't have just one finding. You typically will have multiple findings in a patient. So just because you see one thing, don't stop looking for other abnormalities. Now, gallbladder carcinoma we don't see very often. Um, it can have a variable appearance. It can be a focal soft tissue mass, focal or diffuse wall thickening. It can be a polypoid intraluminal mass. Um, tumor factor sludge can mimic it, adenomyomatosis, polyps, and again, increased risk with porcelain gallbladder. So here's a patient with a large intraluminal mass filling the gallbladder. This is gallbladder carcinoma. Uh, moving on to the biliary tree. So in when we're evaluating these patients under ultrasound, we're looking for um, causes of biliary obstruction in patients with, with jaundice. That's our role as sonographers, so, or sonologists, I should say, as well. Um, one of the most common causes is co cholodocolithiasis, stones in the common duct, and these usually occur in the more distal or intrapancreatic portion of the duct. It can be due to tumors, other causes such as um, inflammation and infection, and we may need MRCP or ERCP for further evaluation. So here's a patient who had considerable intrahepatic biliary dilatation. And we've went further down, and we see this considerable dilatation of the common duct, 1.7 centimeters. So we go further down. We continue, we continue to see um, distension or dilatation of the common duct. And we see a stone distally in the region of the pancreatic head. So we figured out the etiology for all the intrahepatic biliary dilatation. Now, pneumobilia usually occurs um, from prior biliary intervention, it's air within the biliary tree. We see bright echogenic um, linear foci along the portal triads, and we may see some posterior dirty shadowing or ring down artifact like we saw previously. And basically, the air bubbles will move with position change. Um, so here's a patient with pneumobilia. This is the, the liver, and we see sort of multiple echogenic foci sort of branching throughout the liver. And again, when the patient's position changed, the appearance of the echogenic foci also changed. This patient had had prior biliary intervention. Um, even though Dr. Vosi went over the normal pancreas, I just want to illustrate again the importance of knowing your midline anatomy. We frequently see um, abnormalities in the midline without necessarily seeing the pancreas. We want to make sure where these abnormalities are. And again, knowing your vascular landmarks is actually critical um, to sometimes assessing a midline abdominal pathology that is either expected or unexpected by ultrasound. Um, for acute pancreatitis, you know, we don't, use CT, uh, we don't use ultrasound for evaluation. We usually use CT if they need evaluation in addition to clinical evaluation. However, we use ultrasound to evaluate the biliary tract and for possible uh, stones, as in gallstone pancreatitis. And if we see the pancreas by ultrasound, it may be diffusely or focally uh, enlarged with a decreased echogenicity. But we also want to look for peripancreatic fluid, pseudocyst formation, causes of biliary obstruction pancreatic abscess, um, and vascular complications. So here's a midline transverse view of the abdomen, which shows an enlarged, boggy, hypoechoic pancreas. Again, notice your vascular landmarks. This patient had acute pancreatitis. Now this is a patient, this is another transverse midline image. We don't really see the pancreas, but we see this large, complex fluid collection, lots of debris. We have our vascular landmarks. This was a pancreatic pseudocyst. <clears throat> 
Now in chronic pancreatitis, we typically see calcifications that are intraductal. The duct is usually dilated. It can be diffusely dilated. It can be, have a beaded appearance or a tortuous appearance. And we may see alternating areas of um, like enlargement and, um, and atrophy of the pancreas from re repeated scarring, alternating with edema and inflammation. So here's a patient in, this, um, in whom we see the pancreas, we see multiple echogenic foci consistent with calcification, and we see a beaded sort of tortuous pancreatic duct. Now pancreatic cancer, again, with ultrasound, we don't typically image for pancreatic cancer, but we may be the first to incidentally see this in patients with jaundice and we can see ductal dilatation proximal to the tumor. The double duct sign refers to dilatation of the pancreatic and common ducts, which we can also sometimes see with chronic pancreatitis. We may have pancreatic atrophy distal to the tumor. And one of the pitfalls, just to keep in mind, is an accessory spleen um, may mimic a pancreatic mass. So if you see an echogenic mass within the pancreatic tail, think accessory spleen, and this can be confirmed a lot of times with the nuclear medicine uh, red blood cell study. So here's a patient with ill-defined hypoechoic mass within the pancreatic head. So this was incidentally noted, uh, this is in a patient with jaundice, pancreatic carcinoma, further evaluation with CT. So here's another patient with a large mass within the pancreatic head, very heterogeneous. So we see the mass, but then we also looked for, biliary, for ductal dilatation, excuse me. So here we have dilatation of the pancreatic duct up to a close to six millimeters. Cine images depicting the mass with uh, the ductal dilatation across the top. Now, splenomegaly, there are many causes of splenomegaly. Typically, we see splenomegaly in patients with portal hypertension. It can occur in patients with infection or hematologic malignancies, infiltrative processes. So there are many causes. You may also have splenomegaly with associated focal lesions in patients with lymphoma metastases. So here's a patient with splenomegaly. This is a patient with portal hypertension. We see a 14 centimeter spleen, but know that the spleen usually retains its same smooth um, echogenicity, very homogeneous. Another patient with portal hypertension, enlarged spleen, but it's maintaining its uh, crescentic shape and a homogeneous echogenicity. Now splenic cysts, splenic cysts, we call, we say cysts versus pseudocysts in our reports, and you know, we usually move on. And usually these are actually pseudocysts, not actual true cysts. And these are from hematomas that have evolved into seromas. They don't have a cellular lining. And they may have sort of a complex appearance with calcifications and internal debris. Epidermoid cysts or true cysts are actually rare. And other etiologies for splenic cysts include infectious cysts, uh, pancreatic pseudocysts that have eroded into the spleen. And sometimes vascular lesions can mimic cysts. So again, remember to use Doppler to differentiate vascular lesions from cystic lesions. So here's a patient, a longitudinal image of the spleen. Here's a patient with a hypoechoic um, lesion within the spleen, somewhat irregular margins, but we have some increased through transmission, no increased Doppler flow. Uh, we call this a cyst versus pseudocyst. Now here's a patient with a complex cystic lesion within the spleen, lots of debris, diffusely increased through transmission. This patient was sick. This was a splenic abscess. Now, splenic, solid splenic lesions are frequently nonspecific, and you need correlation with the clinical history or other findings on the scan to be able to determine what they are. We typically see in the spleen hemangiomas or lymphangiomas, which are hyperechoic and homogeneous, just like hemangiomas are within the liver. <laughs> Hypoechoic lesions tend to represent um, more ominous etiologies, such as lymphoma or leukemia or metastasis, and they may be unifocal, multifocal, or diffuse. Mess with the spleen are rare, and um, you know, lung is what I fre most frequently seen in the spleen, um, but lung, breast, colon, melanoma, these can all be etiologies um, of splenic metastasis. And other lesions include infarcts, infection, and more rare cases, sarcoid and extramedullary hem hematopoiesis. So this is a patient who has a uniformly hyperechoic lesion within the spleen. Uh, we call this likely splenic hemangioma. We put color on it and really not much increased flow. So, you know, a patient with no risk factors, no history of malignancy, likely hemangioma, and that's okay. Now here's a patient with non-small cell lung cancer in which we see multiple heterogeneous uh, foci within the spleen, multiple heterogeneous appearing lesions. So this is a, a nice appearance of metastatic disease. We also incidentally picked up an adrenal mass, an, um, which was a metastasis. And again, the cine images, which nicely depict a very heterogeneous appearance of metastasis within the spleen. 
Just miscellaneous spleen, um, splenules we see very frequently in individuals. Most of the time we can tell they're splenules because they look exactly like the spleen. They're just smaller, maybe a little bit more round. Um, however, if you're not sure, um, you can do a nuclear medicine tagged red blood cell study to confirm the diagnosis. Um, if you don't see the spleen in the left upper quadrant, in the super rare case, it may be wandering. It may be somewhere else in the abdomen. Um, if the spleen is absent, it could be due to sickle cell disease. It could be due to congenital asplenia. If you see multiple spleens, it also may be a congenital finding. And other lesions in the spleen we can see include lacerations and hematomas. So here's a patient post motor vehicle collision in whom we see sort of a branching sort of uh, hypoechoic foci within the spleen surrounding this hematoma. Incidentally, saw a pleural effusion. Transverse image of the same patient, again, the same finding. So we know that this is a, a local central a focal lesion with some surrounding you know, hypoechoic foci, which was the laceration. And here we see the branching pattern of the vascularity um, extending into the spleen. And this cine images of the patient nicely depict sort of branching uh, pattern of the laceration within the spleen and the focal hematoma. And uh, on the cross-sectional image on the CT, we see the splenic lacerations, also see a liver laceration. Um, moving on to the kidney. Um, in the kidney, uh, you know, we frequently may confuse this with uh, dilated renal pelvis, and this is a left kidney, so I'm actually trying to show you a dromedary hump here. But remember to apply your Doppler because a lot of times these hypoechoic foci that look like pelviectasis or, or um, mild hydronephrosis in the kidney are actually just blood vessels. And again, a dromedary hump would have normal flow, vascular flow. The flow would not be displaced around it or would not be disorganized. Here's another example of a junctional cleft, just a little bit different from the one that Dr. Vosi showed earlier. This is not a duplicated collecting system. We see, connect, we see the full renal sinus fat that's not interrupted. Now, congenital anomalies of the kidneys, we frequently can see that depending on the type of institution you're at, especially if you do a lot of peds. Um, horseshoe kidney, this is connection of the right and left kidney across the midline. And we have a nice uh, cine images to depict that. This is not midline adenopathy. This is solid tissue, parenchymal tissue, attaching the right kidney to the left kidney across the midline, and we see the aorta and the IVC behind that. This is a patient with multicystic dysplastic kidney, and we have the cine images of this patient. We see very little to normal, very little um, renal parenchyma, if any. And these patients can sometimes present with renal failure, and we may be imaging them because of renal failure. Now, hydronephrosis, the hallmark of hydronephrosis is that this is collecting system dilatation that communicates with the renal pelvis. And I try and make it easy. Mild is just dilatation of the renal pelvis. Moderate, the pelvis plus the infundibula. Severe, the pelvis plus the infundibula plus the calyces. So um, just sort of in this, in this pattern. Sometimes the differentiation between mild and moderate and moderate severe is difficult. That's okay as long as you're you know, in the ballpark. And remember, if you see hydronephrosis, have the patient void. Look at the bladder, have the patient void if the bladder's full. Um, or you may actually find a lesion in the bladder. So most obstructive lesions are from the pelvis, so always, always look at the bladder in these patients. So here's a case of mild hydronephrosis. This is a sagittal image of the right kidney in where we see um, dilatation of the, of the renal pelvis. It's their separation of actually the renal sinus fat. Here's a patient with more moderate, possibly moderate to severe hydronephrosis where we see more considerable dilatation of the renal pelvis extending to the infundibula. And although the calyces are mildly dilated, they still maintain their cupped or chalice shape. They're not ballooned or blunted. So you could call this moderate or moderate to severe. And here are the cine images which show you that all of this connects. The, the, the dilatation connects all the way through to the renal pelvis and the proximal ureter. This is a patient with severe hydronephrosis. This is a sagittal image of the kidney. And note that there is um, blunting of the calyces. You don't have the nice cupped or chalice shape. These are blunted calyces. This is severe hydronephrosis. Now what are we going to do? We're going to look at the bladder. Now in the bladder, we only see the left ureteral jet. We don't see the right. So there may be something along the right urinary tract that's obstructing the right kidney. So then we can focus our clinical evaluation um, based on that. Here's another patient with severe hydronephrosis. Again, dilated calyces, which are blunted. Uh, we have dilatation of the infundibula and the pelvis. This is also the right kidney. We looked at the bladder, and we saw a large mass within the bladder. 
a um, little bit of increased flow within that mass. And here are the Cine images to show that this is sort of central, a little bit more eccentric to the right, obstructing uh, the right renal collecting system. This is a patient with an obstructed upper pole moiety, and this only shows you, this is a longitudinal image of the right kidney, so it only really shows you partially. But when you look at the Cine images, this is scrolling superiorly to inferiorly. So superiorly, you see the dilatation of the entire collecting system, and inferiorly, it's normal. So this obstructed upper pole moiety. Now renal stones, um, renal stones, we do ultrasound basically to sometimes to confirm the diagnosis because we really don't want to keep radiating patients just for renal stones. And typically what we want to do by ultrasound is see if there is a stone, see how many there are, how big they are, and are there associated complications? Is there hydronephrosis? Is there perinephric fluid? Are there calculi anywhere else that we can see? And try and hydrate these patients well so to distend their ureters, distend the bladder. You may have improved visualization. And always assess for bladder jets because um, the bladder jet, you may not see if there's a stone obstructing the ureter. Uh, findings of stones. Stones um, are, you, you know, they're non-mobile, they're usually fixed within the kidney, um, but they may or may not have shadowing depending on their size. And also we will see frequently twinkle artifact, like I mentioned before, the artifactual color flow that we get that's not vascular, not arterial or venous. And this can help us distinguish this from um, calcified vessels, which can mimic stones. So here's a transverse image of the left kidney, which shows a large stone within the collecting system and um, some ring down, some shadowing. I'm sorry, some shadowing. And uh, there's twinkle artifact on this, and there's also twinkle artifact um, involving the shadowing as well. So a nice example of you know, calcification with a twinkle artifact. Now renal cysts, um, just like lesions in the thyroid, almost everyone has a renal cyst. It's over half of the population by the age of 50. Cysts can be anywhere, uh, cortical, parapelvic, or medullary. Again, anechoic, well-defined back wall, um, posterior acoustic enhancement. But it's important to note in the kidney that you should really not see a wall, especially against the renal cortex. You really should not be seeing a wall. And if you see a wall, if you think it might be thickened, this will um, prompt further evaluation. And small cysts are very difficult sometimes to determine by ultrasound. We're not good at determining um, what lesions are that are less than two centimeters very frequently, especially less than one centimeter. And you may have internal echoes in these cysts from hemorrhage um, or debris. And it's important when you look at a cyst, assess for the internal echoes, assess for the septations, calcifications. Is there a thickened wall? Is there mural nodularity? These are all very important things to assess for. Here's a patient who has multiple parapelvic cysts. And you may wonder, well, why isn't this hydronephrosis? Well, these cysts do not co co um, connect with the collecting system. This is a um, sagittal view, and this is the transverse view. And here we have the cine images showing we have multiple parapelvic cysts, but none of them connect with the renal pelvis. So there is, this is not hydronephrosis. It doesn't have the nice branching pattern that we saw with the hydronephrosis with the dilated infundibula. Now, complex renal cysts, there are several ways to manage complex renal cysts. Um, cysts that you may not need to follow or maybe just do a one-time follow-up for. These are cysts that would just have maybe a few septations, few means two or three. Um, calcification, if you see it, should be thin, curvilinear or like very peripheral along the cyst. Sometimes you may see some milk of calcium, calcium. And cysts that may have internal echoes from a hemorrhage or debris. These are cysts that you may not need to follow, but if you're not confident, doing a follow-up in three or six months is, is, is reasonable. However, you should consider doing CT or MRI pre and post contrast for cysts um, having, that have a thickened wall or mural nodularity, multiple thick calcified or hypervascular septations, amorphous or central calcification, or if you just simply can't characterize it in any way, you can't see it completely. And remember, always use Doppler to characterize lesions. So here are two patients with hemorrhagic renal cysts. Um, this cyst is basically very complex, multiple internal echoes, diffusely increased through transmission, no increased Doppler flow. This was a hemorrhagic renal cyst. And again, confirmation with CT or, MI, or MRI. Um, here's another patient with a hemorrhagic renal cyst. Um, down here posteriorly, we see the renal cyst, um, subsetation, some debris, partially anechoic, diffusely increased through transmission, a um, little bit of dilatation in the adjacent collecting system. This is a patient with simple and hemorrhagic renal cysts. If you look at the images, you'll see several simple cysts followed by a hemorrhagic cyst with internal debris. And we have a still image of that hemorrhagic cyst with the, some internal debris. 
Now, um, calcified renal cysts, we see also very commonly. Here we have calcification with some shadowing. Here's another patient with a calcified renal cyst. We see the echogenic line consistent with the calcification with some shadowing. And now we have a calcified hemorrhagic renal cyst. We have all the findings. So we have a, we have a mass that has, is, has fluid fluid levels in it, partially anechoic, uh, some layering fluid. We have calcification along the wall. We have some increased sued transmission. And just what a nice comparison for us, incidentally noted, is a simple cyst right next to it. And here the cine image is depicting the shadowing from the calcification of the hemorrhagic renal cyst. Um, now for this patient, um, depending on your level of confidence, again, following this patient up with um, CT would be great because of the calcification, but you could also comfortably call this a calcified hemorrhagic renal cyst, especially since there's no increased Doppler flow. Now polycystic kidney disease, the hallmark of a polycystic kidney disease is enlarged um, kidneys with multiple cortical and medullary cysts without normal intervening renal parenchyma. Early on in the disease process, in patients under the age of 30, you may see normal renal parenchyma, but as these patients age, you should not see normal renal parenchyma. And basically, we use ultrasound in these patients to identify um, other sites of cysts, such as the liver or the pancreas, to screen family members, and also to follow up the cyst. And basically, we should use the same criteria for individual renal cyst evaluation uh, for each of these cysts within the polycystic kidneys. It can be very, very cumbersome. And just remember that hemorrhage is common in PCKD, and so um, following these lesions up in three to six months for regression um, is actually very reasonable before progressing to other uh, cross-sectional imaging modalities such as CT, which would increase the radiation. Now here's a patient with polycystic um, kidney disease, multiple cysts within the liver, not much really intervening renal parenchyma. I'm sorry, I said liver, I meant kidney. And the kidney was actually enlarged, it was about 16 centimeters. Now acquired cystic kidney disease is usually due to dialysis, long-term dialysis. Most patients have this after five years, and there is an increased incidence of renal cell carcinoma. And the hallmark appearance, small echogenic kidneys with multiple small cysts. And again, just like PCKD, hemorrhage in these cysts is common. So if you see a complex cyst, it's okay to follow the cyst up in three months to see if it's stable or if it has regressed in size. So here we see the liver very nicely, but where's the kidney? It's hiding um, in the background of the, of the fat. And here we have the cine images, which you can a little bit more easily see the kidney, but you really better see the cysts that are within that kidney. So these kidneys are often very difficult to see. Now renal cell carcinoma, all solid renal masses, in my opinion, are renal cell carcinoma until you prove them otherwise. If I see a solid mass in a kidney, I'm calling it renal cell carcinoma, even though there's an up to 10, 20, 30 percent chance it could be benign depending on what literature you read. So if you see a suspicious renal lesion, um, you know, we're going to work up that patient with CT and sometimes with MRI, but ultrasound tells us many important things. So just because we see it doesn't mean we stop. We should still try and characterize it as much as possible. Is the lesion, how big is it? Is it solid? Is it cystic? Are there septations? Is there calcification? Is there necrosis? Uh, what about the vascularity of the lesion or the, of the septations? Is there mural nodularity? Are there other lesions in the kidney? 10% of renal cells have another lesion in the same kidney. 1%, there's a contralateral renal cell carcinoma. Um, are there any lesions in the liver? Do we incidentally see adrenal lesions, adenopathy? And we have to assess for the vascular patency. Is the renal vein patent? Is the IVC patent? And remember that a hypertrophied column of Bertine or dromedary hump can mimic a renal mass, especially in the left kidney. So don't fall for that trick. Again, apply your Doppler. So here's a patient with what I call a well-behaved renal cell carcinoma. We have um, so a homogeneous, um, mildly hyperechoic um, mass. And you may say, well, there looks like there's some increased sewage transmission. Renal cells can have that sometimes because they may have multiple tiny, tiny cysts in them. And we applied some Doppler to this. We see some increased flow. And this, to me, is a renal cell until proven otherwise. Here's um, the cine images, which nicely depict the flow within the lesion. And the coronal CT images, um, which shows a, a heterogeneously enhancing mass within the right kidney. Now this is um, not a well-behaved renal cell carcinoma. This is, an this is a mass infiltrating the right kidney, basically. I can't tell what's normal renal cortex and what's mass, and it, the margins are very irregular. And so we applied Doppler, 
and this is the transverse image of that same kidney. And here, this is the right renal vein, and um, this is all thrombus, tumor thrombus filling the right renal vein. So next, we assess the IVC, and we see soft tissue within the IVC, and when we apply Doppler, we saw that there is flow. So this is tumor thrombus extending into the uh, renal vein and into the IVC. And the cine images of the kidney show this mass infiltrating the right kidney, and you see a little bit of normal cortex in the near field, but the rest of it is really difficult to discern. Now, angiomyolipomas are typically echogenic lesions that are, are either in the renal cortex or, um, or they're exophytic, and they're similar in echogenesis to the renal sinus fat. My experience has been that these are more typically cortical rather than exophytic, and that may help sometimes in differentiating them from renal cell carcinoma. However, if they're lipid poor or hemorrhagic, they may be hypoechoic, and this, um, this uh, makes basically a, a diagnostic conundrum for us. We really don't know what to do with these, and in some patients, this prompts obviously further evaluation with CT or MRI um, to look for focal fat, but also may be an indication for biopsy in some patients. And um, you know we can look for focal fat on CT like we're traditionally taught to, but remember that a small percentage of renal cells can also contain focal fat. So again, just be aware of that pitfall. And we worry about renal um, angiomyolipomas when uh, they exceed four centimeters because there's an increased risk of hemorrhage. This is a patient with tuberous sclerosis who has multiple um, echogenic lesions, predominantly cortical. These are multiple AMLs in a patient with tuberous sclerosis. And the cine images, Again, showing the same thing, just innumerable AMLs in the, in the right kidney. Now, transitional car cell carcinoma, um, as we all know, this typically occurs in the bladder. However, if it does occur in the kidney, uh, we may see peripelvic, parenchymal, and infiltrative extension. We may see calyectasis. Blood clots are the most common mimicker. And if we suspect transitional car cell carcinoma, of course, we're going to recommend a CT urogram. And the patient also needs urologic evaluation with cystoscopy and ureteroscopy. So here's a transver transverse image of the kidney depicting a dilated renal pelvis with the soft tissue in it. And also, there's some calyectasis. And this was either some soft tissue or some hemorrhage within that calyx. This was transitional cell. Now, other renal masses include oncocytoma, lymphoma, METS and uh, PTLD. And oncocytomas, imaging-wise, you really can't tell from renal cell carcinomas. There, there's more and more in the literature about biopsying lesions, uh, which is um, beyond the scope of this talk. But lymphoma can be, is also rare, but it, it can be focal or infiltrative. Um, metastases, um, you usually cannot distinguish these from um, renal cell carcinoma. However, if there's a patient with, say, a primary lung cancer who also has a solid renal lesion, in my opinion, that's still a renal cell carcinoma until we prove otherwise. And in patients with PTLD, it's, it's very important to recognize um, this, di this potential diagnosis because if you diagnose a patient with PTLD, that will affect their immunosuppressive therapy. So this is a patient with renal, cell, with renal lymphoma. This is an infiltrating lesion, basically invading the renal sinus and cortex of the right kidney. And you may say, well, are you sure you're not angling in a kind of different way in a young, healthy patient? Let's look at the contralateral kidney. So this is the cortex in the contralateral kidney. We did cine images of this patient, and we see this infiltrating process extending into the renal sinus and the cortex. Now this is a right lower quadrant transplant kidney. We saw a hypoechoic lesion in this kidney. And we apply you know, power Doppler. There's really not much increased flow. We're not really sure what this is, but we think it could be PTLD. So this was biopsy proven PTLD. Again, that changes the immunosuppressive therapy of this patient, so very important to recognize. Um, renal infection and pilo, we typically don't image the kidney with ultrasound for pilo. However, in patients who can't get CT, especially pregnant patients, we, look, we use ultrasound to look for complications. Ultrasound is typically normal in pilo. The findings may be very subtle, and here are many findings that we could uh, potentially see. But the most important thing to look for is to look for air, because if we have emphysema as pilo, um, that's a surgical emergency. So here's a patient with pyelonephritis. This is a sagittal image of the right kidney. And the findings are extremely subtle. Here's a transverse image. You may argue there's a little bit of change in the echogenicity in this portion of the kidney with respect to the rest of the cortex. Questionably decreased flow, but again, we're not really, really that good at it by ultrasound.
Here's a patient with HIV, the hallmark of HIV kidneys, enlarged echogenic kidneys bilaterally. So again, this is 15-centimeter kidney, enlarged echogenic kidneys bilaterally. Incidental lesions that we may see by ultrasound, we may see adrenal lesions. Typically, these will be adenomas, but sometimes they may be metastases or other types of renal lesions. Um, we can evaluate these uh, with a CT or MRI, depending on what we think they might be. Effusions, we saw one earlier, ascites, adenopathy, abscess formation, hernias, and abdominal wall lesions. Here's a patient in whom we saw an adrenal lesion. This is a sagittal image of the right kidney, and um, here we see a little, little adrenal lesion. METS. This is a patient with lymphoma, lymphoid tissue adjacent to the hilum of the liver and the spleen. Retroperitoneal adenopathy, again, notice your landmarks. Insulin noted dilated bowel, patient with abdominal pain. Um, hernia, um, abscess in the abdominal wall post op. Take home points. Um, so, although we use MRI and CT to confirm or f further evaluate many ultrasound findings, ultrasound is useful for evaluating many different disease processes and to follow them up and to screen patients. New liver lesions in a patient with hep C cirrhosis are HCC until proven otherwise. New solid renal lesions represent renal cell carcinoma until proven otherwise. And Cine and Doppler are your friends. Thank you for your attention.